Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Awasu Ganwe. I am a local producer. This afternoon, the OOCI DJ, Occasional Open Contact Improvisation Dance Jam that I'm presenting, uh, we're gonna talk about, the title is, Celebrate Dead While You Can, because they do not li live forever. They may be gone someday soon. In my case, my dad's not here, right? So that's what we do, okay? And uh, we have a couple of uh, cuts to prevent, a couple of clips to present from the CI40 Festival in Detroit, a 4th to 6th of May that I went to. And the first one is called uh, Stephanie Relating. The t our teacher, Pam, Pam Johnson from Toronto uh, wanted us to relate, not just to one person, not just to one dancer, but two or more. Yeah, so, yeah, I, please uh, forgive me. I, I cannot do this real quick. I do the best I can, and so today we're gonna show two more, and uh, then we'll also show part of the uh, birth and the growth of CI, of contact improvisation. So that's Pam Johnson. Yeah, yeah, we're very fortunate that she came to Detroit to be with us and reminded us it's CI 40. Yes, yes, very important. Okay, why did CI spread so quickly all around the world? Everybody just loves it and everybody can do it, you know? So she's going to tell us about it. Thank you. I'm going to do some dancing, then we'll talk. But today, today being that it's so hot, I won't dance as long. I will dance this just less, less, a few minutes. Thank you.
Down in yon forest there stands a hall, the bells of paradise are
and, and also very specifically the elitism of um, art of the period um, that you had to go to school and learn from a master and it was fairly expensive to go and see it, um, you had to pay a lot of money for it. Um, and of course, those developments were happening at the same period of time when we saw the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, um, anti-Vietnam War Movement, um, women's liberation, gay li lesbian liberation, this whole period of time of looking at the structures of society, so it wasn't separated from that. Um, and contact was picking up on a lot of the developments that had happened in, in to um, create um, the the community or the developed art aspect of improvisational dance, which was quite new in the late 1950s, and very similarly to what was going on in, in things like other other um, art forms, jazz, music, the questioning of do we have to do it the way it was done before in dance? The question of do we have to learn a specific vocabulary? Um, do we have to learn it from a master? Do we have to perform it in a fancy costume with, with, sh with um, funny shoes and in a big museum stage? So all those things are coming into question. And um, the <laughs> I don't know how true this is, but the, the history says that the very first one of these contemporary dance performances actually was done in Yoko Ono's loft in New York City in 1962. A dance performance in a loft space outside of the theater space. It may have not been the very first one, but it's the most famous early one. Um, and, the, and the content of these dances was really changing. So um, the, the vocabulary, the contemporary vocabulary, the ballet vocabulary, all that stuff was, was being thrown out and people were doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, uh, nothing walking, <coughs> running, Aikido. And he just talked to these men about what um, they, what, what, why they were interested in dance. A couple of the things that they said was that they were not as socialized to this flexibility of the hip joint as they felt that women were. They wanted to dance. They felt that they were not able to engage with their upper body as much, which was something they felt more socialized to do. And so they started working on this form. And people have seen Magnesium. I don't know the, the film. Um, sort of looks. Uh, the film Magnesium, which is the culmination of that class and the very first contact performance, which happens to be on film, which is quite amazing. And I mean, when you just look at it, it's like there's people slam dancing on mats in unitards. It's bizarre. It's really, but the kernel of the form was all there, and they were working with the basic ideas that would become the underlying kind of physics of contact improvisation. And they, but they were also discovering the things that were the surprise and that sort of the wonder and the joy, which is that they, they, they could use the physics to make this a form that anybody could do, to make it a form that didn't require upper body strength or any particular strength. Um, and I think the most, um, maybe the most important thing is that they could have a communication that was nonverbal that allowed them to go through this gigantic range of dynamics from very small things to fly in the air um, without having to talk about it or practice or do any sort of preparation, that it came out of that relationship that, that comes through kinesthetics and eye contact, the stuff we've been working on, um, and that it was just um, a fantastic thing. And I think we know, all know from doing the dance that it feels like an amazing thing. Um, I mean, I think it is a skill of nonverbal communication that we actually have, and we use it a lot of times in our lives, so we don't really get to dive in and experience and put it into this form, um, and that it, except in a place like, except in contact improvisation, I think it's quite unique. And it very much transcends our way of interacting with people, mm -hmm. um, that you get to, to touch people, which has particular meanings in most situations in our lives, and has a different meaning here. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, it became the form that it is as a result of the, not just the mechanics of it, but that uh, understanding. There's a couple of other, I think, really interesting things about um, the form um, that mean that we're here right now in Detroit in a, uh, getting to practice it in a community setting. In 1972 or three, when they, um, what, what happened was Steve Paxton did his class in, in Oberlin, he actually went back to New York and a couple of people went with him, including Nancy Stark Smith, and they began to really develop this form. And they did another show at the Weber Gallery in New York City. Uh, several months later, and that really became the first contact performance where they had they were starting to understand that they had a form that they were working with. 
And maybe a year or so after that, when that form was developing, people were coming and getting interested in it. People were starting to teach it. Um, the question came up about whether or not they should kind of codify it, make it a system, um, trademark it, claim it. And at that moment, they decided not to do that. Um, and it was a very, very conscious decision. Um, and they did it because they did not want to replicate the sort of elitism um, of dance before. They were very, very, uh, it was very important for them to keep contact as a community form. And they sort of, at that moment, because there was no school of contact, um, because it was happening in the community and not just the art space, I think the jam became one of the main ways that it is practiced and continued um, here and all over the world. And my feeling is that the reason that it, it, it's also become really popular in, in the 40 years, it, the, the reach of this form, it's, it's amazing. Um, and it took the whole hundred and something years of contemporary dance to get the bar with this much of a reach that contact has gotten this quickly. And I think it's partly because uh, they haven't codified it, they haven't made it um, exclusive, it's very accessible. And at the same time, if people have gone to jams in other places or you come from somewhere else and here to a jam, the integrity of the form all over the world is incredible. You can go to um, Hong Kong and go to a contact jam and it will be much like this. Um, parts of South Asia, parts of Africa now, um, uh, and all over South America. Um, very, very popular there. So the form has an incredible integrity. It has, it's been able to uh, find its way to different cultures and areas, and that's why people spreading it. And it's kind of through the that care that we take in um, teaching the basic ideas of it and ha creating the community around it that I think is also what really supports it. Um, and also, I think. It's the form, because it's based on the physics of the body. You don't have to learn specialized movement um, so that everybody can do it. You can learn it fairly quickly. It takes some practice to be able to do it really well. And I think in that way, it's, it's an incredibly unique form. And I wasn't sure in the last while whether it would continue to have resonance for people, but it does seem to have resonance. I mean, I would say that in terms of who who does it in North America? It's mostly middle class people, mostly white people. Still, there is some development and diversification. It's um, become available through uh, university dance programs now. Um, and, and I teach it in theater departments as well. It's becoming a little bit more, it really has infused the aesthetic of, of dance. And um, it's informed other uh, techniques like the axis syllabus. I don't know if people are aware of the axis syllabus. Um, it's more popular, I think, in Europe. Um, and you know, watching the dynamic of gravity, you can see that in all kinds of ballet work these days as well. So it has been very influential. But I think the form that the the, uh, the community aspect of it is is also incredibly important to keeping it going and moving. So that almost every contact event is a mix of people who may be working with it professionally and also maybe working with it um, as their personal rec recreational thing. Um, and in that way, I just think it's really unique history. So I don't have too much more to say, and I just would love to have people comment or talk about that or add something in. Um, and I just would hope that people would carry this history with them a little bit so that we can keep this as it is, because it would be easy for it to um, get lost. Um, I know that there, there's talk of writing the history down. Some of this is available in a book called Sharing the Dance. Uh, some of it is available in tiny bits and pieces in the contact quarterly. Um, but it would be great to pass this on. I think it's such a, a fantastic gem that we have. Yeah, I, I, what do Q&A is discussed. Where did, the, where, where did the, for the name first emerge in that Oberlin, New York transition? I think that was Steve Paxton, and I can't remember the details, so that's a really good question. Um, I guess I'll have to Google that one. <laughs> I think it was Steve saying, well, it looks like we're doing contact and it's improvisation, contact improvisation, something like, something very sort of, they didn't sit down and think about the name, it was just like, uh, what are we gonna call this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were you gonna say? I, mean, I was wondering if you knew if there was any overlap with the Fluxus movement, since you mentioned Yoko Ono and the 16th and the Martin Fluxus. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, I was just asking if you're familiar with the Fluxus movement, I was wondering if there was any overlap in terms of the ideas and the dancing. I think there was an incredible amount of 
across pollinization in the in the sixties. So there's you know John Cage working with Merce Cunningham, and um, I don't know specifically about Alexis personally, but I do think there was an incredible cross pollinization during this period era of the post development post modern dance that those dancers were working with lots of other artists at the time. Can you can you say what you think about the um, it was kind of a really similar idea, but more so in the art sense. So like an anti-art, non-art sort of movement that Yoko Ono and John Cage were both sometimes involved in. So it was mostly like visual art, or little like one cent scores to do a piece that anybody could do. But there were also, I'm not that familiar with it, but I think there were also really improvised musical, dancey type things going on. But I'm not that familiar with it. There's actually an exhibit at the Art Museum, but there's always this exhibit right now. It's really messy. Lexus. 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 How do you spell it? F L U X U S. F L U X E S U S.